Okay, so we are live on Facebook. I think we're live now. Hi, guys. Hello. Okay, so because you've asked us for more, so now Sir Irvin will discuss us about writing. So if you guys interested and would like to ask uh, your questions with regard to the writing subtest for our IELTS exam, you may do so. However, do it after the lecture. Okay, so however, Sir Irvin will make it more interactive for us. So, if possible, you need to uh, you need to ask your questions so that it will not be uh, left uh, behind. Okay, so Sir Irvin, are you ready? Can we start? Okay, so I'll I'll give you the spotlight. <laughs> okay, later when we ask the others on Facebook Live to participate or to answer my question. It's just that I cannot see their comments on Facebook. So maybe we can just type in their comments okay. on the chat box. Okay, I'll just put it on the comment box or chat box. Okay. Rather. Okay, thank so, you. Okay. Thank you. I'll just share. Okay, sound check, check, mic one, two. So guys, welcome to our round two of live and interactive IELTS lecture. Last week, we talked about speaking. Now this time, we're going to focus on writing. Now, everyone knows that writing is further subdivided into two. Task one is different for academic and general training candidates, whereas writing task two is exactly the same for all. So far, we have 21 participants here in our Zoom meeting. I just need to ask, how many of you guys are going to take academic module? Okay, kindly comment me. Let's take a look how many are taking the academic module. I just need to see the chat box chat okay how many of you are taking the academic module okay i'm planning me me okay me i'm just curious do we have anyone here who's going to take general training module Kali type gt how many are planning to take general training no one is taking general training okay Okay, we have one. So, for the benefit of the others who are not yet sure, hmm, which one am I going to take? Is it the academic or the general training module? Guys, I'll give you an idea. So, academic model is usually intended for, number one, those who are going to apply for student visa. So, regardless of the school, country, or course, it's the academic module that you're going to take if you're applying for a student visa. Number two, if you're a nurse planning to work in US, UK, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, it's the academic module. Now, some of you are wondering, if that is the case, then who are taking the general training module? Number one, those who are applying for spouse visa. Number two, fiance visa. Number three, the skilled workers applying for working visas. So who are the skilled workers? Butchers, welders, electricians, linemen, mechanics, and the like. Number four, those who are applying for live-in caregiver program. Number five, those who are migrating to Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And number six, the rad techs who are going to the United Kingdom. So these are the people who are usually taking the general training module. So in the actual examination, listening, speaking are exactly the same for academic and general training. In reading, there is a slight difference between the two. And what do I mean when I say slight? They have the same types of questions. So there's fill in the blanks, multiple choice. At the same time, there's matching headings and true-false not given. It's just that general training passages are usually shorter and academic passages are longer. Plus, the level of difficulty for academic, definitely it's more challenging than the general training. What about writing task two? Task one and ta uh, 
task to academic and general training exactly is exactly the same concept and what is this concept essay writing it's just that for academic candidates the questions are more complicated as compared to the general training writing task one is totally different for the two modules the academic candidates are going to write a statistical report whereas the general training candidates are required to come up with a letter Writing task one, whether academic or general training, you are required to write at least 150 words. So can you take note? That is the minimum. Why? The moment you fail to reach 150 words automatically, that is a grade of five in writing. We don't want anyone getting a low band score just because the writing task is unfinished. And this is the reason why we need everyone in your capacity to reach the minimum number of words. What about the maximum? If you look at Cambridge books, they don't say anything about the maximum number of words. It's just that in the actual examination, there is what we call maximum time limit. So you might notice that your test booklet will tell you, you are given 20 minutes to finish task one and you are given 40 minutes to finish task two. But it's not as if the test supervisors in the actual examination do that. So what exactly do they do? They give you one hour to finish both task one and task two, and that is regardless of the time that you spent for each task. So whether it's 30 minutes for each, it really doesn't matter. What's most important both of them are completed in one hour. Now, what about the values? Task one is worth 33.3% of your grade, whereas task two, 66.6%. Now, the question is, between the two, which task are you supposed to prioritize in the actual exam? Is it task one or task two? Kindly type on the chat box. Which one should you prioritize? Is it task one or task two? We need this to be participative. So from time to time, I'll be asking questions and I expect the candidates to respond. That's the way for me to know that you are still with me. So thank you guys for responding. It's task two. So this is the recommendation of 9.09 in the actual examination. I'd like you to begin with task two. Now you're going to ask, why can't we start with writing task one? Of course, it is possible to start with writing task one. It's just that. When I spoke to the two big bosses of IELTS in Asia, Dr. Victoria Clark and Dr. Joanna Motorab, when we met four years ago, an important lesson I've learned from them, that yes, there are people who cannot finish two tasks in one hour. And Usually, how many people or how many candidates, what's like the percentage that 20% cannot finish both task one and task two in the actual examination? What if, God forbid, you are part of the 20% who cannot finish the two tasks in the actual exam? Let's compare the deduction. What if you finish task two, but you were not able to finish task one? Expect that there's a deduction for that because your task one is unfinished. But kindly compare the deduction. If you finish task one, but you're not able to finish task two, the deduction is twice as much. That is why for everyone to know, start the actual examination with writing task two. Now for tonight, we're going to focus on the four criteria that examiners use in assessing your performance. So of the four criteria, the first two are assessed exclusively in writing, whereas the last two are the ones assessed in both writing and speaking. Let's begin with criterion number one. By the way, you will notice that I have an MS Word document right here. If you want to screenshot, go ahead. No problem. I won't take it against anyone. If you want to take down notes while you're attending the class, Go ahead. By all means, you do that. What's most important, we're able to help you map your chances in getting the required band score in the writing subtest. So let's take a look at the first criterion. Okay, there you go, guys. That's task achievement and task response. Basically, when do we call it task achievement and when do we call it task response? In the actual examination, you call it TA or task achievement if it's writing task one. 
you call it TR or task response if it's writing task two. Now you want to ask, how come it's the case? It's very simple. In writing task one, you are not answering any question. That is why you are not responding. Instead, you come up with an objective report. So the question is, were you able to achieve what the task description requires you to do? This is why in task one, we call it TA. However, it's called task response in task two because this is when you give your opinion. Have you ever wondered why in the actual examination you're required to come up with two tasks when in the first place it could have been one? It's very simple logic. Task one, no opinion whatsoever. Task two, this is when you are expected to present your opinion. So we call it task response in writing task two. This criterion pertains to your ability to come up with a complete writing task. Now, I need you to take note of the following questions. I hope you have your pen and paper with you because I need you to ask yourself these five questions in the actual exam. It's only when you answer yes to all five questions that you expect a satisfactory grade for criterion number one. Guys, are you ready with your pen and paper? If you don't have your pen and paper with you, hopefully you have a gadget with you now. You can use your notepad. Okay, let's begin with question number one. Kindly write this down. Were you able to finish the writing task? So when we say finish, you are expected to come up with a closure, not hanging. In the event that the writing task is unfinished, do not expect at least seven for task response. I hope you're finished writing the first question. Now let's proceed to question number two. The second question you must ask yourself in the actual examination, were you able to write more than the required number of words? So in the case of task one, minimum of 150 words. Task two, minimum of 100, uh, rather 250 words. Now some people are asking, what if, sir, I was able to finish the writing task. I have an intro, body, and conclusion. It's just not for writing tasks. So I only have 230 words. I am so sorry to inform you guys. Even if you have a conclusion, but your writing task has less than the required number of words, that means to say your writing task is incomplete. The only time we say your writing is complete is when you have a conclusion. It has a proper closure plus minimum number of words. Now, let us proceed to number three. And what's question number three? The most important of them all. Were you able to fully and appropriately answer the question? IELTS examiners notice that for Asians, English is not really a foreign language to us. I mean, let's admit it. We're exposed to English since birth. And for some of us, we're even more comfortable in English than our own national language. That is why there are a lot of Asians who can come up with long essays. It's just that IELTS examiners the world over notice that there are candidates who write super long essays, but there are points which are off topic. So, to give you a perfect example, okay, what if the question is the best way to solve the world's environmental problem is to increase the cost of fuel? Agree or disagree? By the way, that's a simple question that we're going to discuss later on because later we're going to look at a sample model essay that was contributed by Sir Brian Martin Shawson, one of our lecturers who got 9.0 in writing. Now, remember the words in the question. What if in your introduction you wrote something like, I agree that one way of solving the environmental problem is to increase the cost of fuel. I am sorry, but if that is your introduction, you are not responding to the question anymore. Why? Let's go back to the exact words in the task description. It says the best way. In your introduction, you wrote one way. 
I am so sorry. One way is not the same as the best way. The only way for you to come up with an essay that's responsive to the question is when you understand the words in the question. So before you come up with an essay, make sure you brainstorm for ideas first. You identify the keywords. Later on, as part of our lecture, we're going to do just that. Now, let's go back to full and appropriate answer. Say, for instance, the question asks for causes and effects. But what if in your essay, you've enumerated causes, you've mentioned effects, and you've provided solutions? If the question is not looking for solutions, do not provide what is not asked. You always have to go back to the question. Now, I have noticed that there are certain candidates who keep on asking me, sir, is it true the longer the essay, the higher the grade. Before I answer that question, I am going to throw that question back at you guys. Will you please comment on the chat box? True or false? The longer the essay, the higher the grade. True or false? Okay, Rowena said false. What about the others? False, 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 false. It seems to me that everyone got it right. Remember, Task uh, the first criterion does not say length. If it's length, then that means to say you just have to keep on writing and writing even if it's nonsense. IELTS examiners are very particular with how you answer the question because that will determine whether you are answering the question and if you're able to come up with an output that meets the standards of examiners. Remember, they expect you to be at least scholastic Majority of people who are taking the IELTS are those who are planning to pursue further education and number two, apply for professional qualifications such as license. So how can they admit someone who lacks intelligence, who lacks substance? That's why, please make sure that you are not off topic. If it's something that will make your essay longer, but it's not addressing the task description, please forget about it. Okay? Now, let us move on to number four. And what is the fourth question that you need to ask yourself in the actual examination? Please write this down. Were you able to provide examples as part of your essay? Can you write that down? When I attended writing workshops conducted by IELTS examiners, they reminded me and the other participants, no matter how strong the arguments are, but if you don't write examples to support your argument, then please do not expect that you're going to get at least seven for the first criterion. Now, if there are almost 35 examiners in the Philippines, and I've met more than 20 of them, by the way, nothing to worry if you are not taking the examination in the Philippines, because these examiners are global examiners and not just Philippine examiners. It's just that I've met most of them when they conduct after the workshop in the Philippines. And if there is a very important tip that I'd like to share to all our attendees for tonight, Majority of them prefer global examples as compared to local examples. I'll give you an idea. Before, the writing tasks are checked in the country where you are taking the examination. But right now, the writing tasks are forwarded to the headquarters of British Council and IDB, and that's where they are checked. Now, What's the function of the examiners per country? They are the ones who assess the candidates in the speaking subtest. However, for the essays, they are forwarded to UK if you're taking it in British Council or they are forwarded all the way down to Australia if you're taking it in IDB. And this is what they've noticed. They know for a fact if someone taking the examination is from the Philippines or from other Asian countries. Why? Because when we give examples, we always prefer to write local examples as if the world revolves around us. Now, I'm going to ask this simple question and I need you to comment okay, on the chat box. What if the topic has something to do with 
tourist destination? Will you please comment? What's the first tourist destination that comes to your mind? May I see? What's the first tourist destination that comes to your mind? Guys, I'm waiting. We need this to be participative. Okay, so I have with me here Switzerland, Paris, Boracay, Boracay, Korea, Paris, Palawan, and so on, Korea. So what is it that you've noticed? The Filipino candidates perhaps are the ones who answered Boracay and Palawan. So if I am an examiner based in UK, if I am an examiner based in Australia, and I read Boracay, I read Palawan, the examiner will automatically know that, ah, okay, the, the person who came up with this output is Filipino. Now, According to most examiners, they prefer global over local examples for the simple reason that almost everyone can think of a local example, but not everyone can think of a global example. Class, right now, I'm going to throw the question back at you. Will you please give me an interesting global example of a tourist destination? Okay. Apart from Boracay, apart, apart from Switzerland, let's take a look if you have some interesting examples to share with the rest of the participants for tonight. Okay, so Jesus answered Sapporo, Japan. Okay, what about the others? Okay, Nihi Sumba. Wow, that is what you call an interesting answer. Okay, Master G, yes, Aurora Borealis. Well, there is a Pattaya in Thailand. Now, if you're going to ask me, instead of talking about Boracay or Palawan, I'm going to share with you Seoul Himayukal Ice Mountain in Iceland. Imagine examiners, most of them, interview up to 25 candidates in speaking every day, and they check as many essays as they can. So if they keep on reading exactly the same examples, their job tends to be a little boring when they encounter the same and predictable answers and examples. So by mentioning something unique, like your classmate who said uh, Nihi Sumba, or my example, which is Seoul Himayukal Ice Mountain in Iceland, definitely you will stand out from the rest. So this is an uh, this is a tip that I'd like to share with you. Thank you, Gia, for sharing Matterhorn in Switzerland. Remember, when thinking of an example, start with something that is global before you consider something that is local. But what about the fifth question that I need you to ask yourself in the actual examination? What is this fifth question? In the event that you cannot think of a global or a local example, were you able to share a personal experience as part of your essay? Okay. So going back, to the tip that I've learned from examiners, they prefer global over local over personal examples. But why is this the case? For sure, all the candidates can think of something that's personal. That's why it's no-brainer. But a personal example is better as compared to no example at all. Now, if everyone gets to think of a personal example, fewer people can think of a local example, but definitely only a handful can think of a global example in the actual exam. That's why they prefer global over local over personal examples in that order. Now, let's have a recap of these five questions. Were you able to finish the writing task with a proper closure? Were you able to come up with a minimum number of words, and that's 250? Number three, were you able to fully and appropriately answer the question? Number four, were you able to provide examples as part of your essay? Or if you cannot think of a global or a local example, that's when you include a personal experience. Now, the stat that I'm going to share with you is something that you cannot find when you visit the official website of www.ielts.org. Why? When you go to that website, what you can see is the national average per subtest, but it does not have a breakdown of our performance per criterion. So last week, when we talked about the speaking subtest, okay, I understand that we have foreigners here, non-Filipinos. It's just that I am a Filipino IELTS reviewer, 
and majority of my students in class are Filipinos. That's why the statistics that I have, that's the stats for the Filipino candidates. Now, what about the national average grade in writing? For the Philippines, now it's 6.1. May I just ask you guys, 6.1 as our national average, do you consider this to be bad news or good news? Type, if 6.1 is the typical grade that Filipinos get in writing, is this good news or bad news? May I see your comments, please? You just have two options. Type, good or bad? Okay, Janine said good, uh, Jesus bad. Okay, well, it's actually both good and bad. But why both good and bad? It depends on what grade you need, right? Say, for instance, if you are targeting UK or Ireland, these countries require a 6.5 in writing. Imagine if this is your required bad score, but this is the national average. It means to say you have to be better than the average candidate to get the required score of 6.5. How much more if you're targeting Australia or New Zealand? Because these countries require the nurses, the immigrants to get a higher band score at 7 in writing. 6.1, your national average. This is 6.5, the requirement of UK and Ireland. Well, this is seven the requirement of australia and new zealand so we are not discouraging you from going to australia and new zealand what we're saying is you need to have clear we need to manage your expectations if you're planning to go there because seven is not something that everyone can get in writing but perhaps those who answer it good are those who number one <coughs> excuse me, going to the United States of America. Why is this good news? 6.1 if you're targeting America. That's because U.S. does not require a specific bad score in writing. Even if you get a 6 in writing, you can still go to the United States of America for as long as you're speaking is 7 and your overall bad score, 6.5. Now, someone asked me, sir, if I get 5.5 in writing, can I still go to the United States? Of course. Just make sure that there is subtests that will pull you up. So if you're a 6.5 in listening, you're getting 6 point, uh, rather 6 in reading, 5.5 in writing, and a 7 in speaking, that will still give you 6.5 overall band score. Now you're going to ask me, how do they compute the overall band score? Class, there is no 0.25 and no 0.75 in the IELTS. So 0.25 is automatically rounded up to 0.5, whereas 0.75 is rounded up to 0 0.0. That's why. Take it from me, straight from the horse's mouth. If you are below average in writing, you can still go to the United States of America. But if I may ask you once again, which grade are you supposed to have as a personal target? Not necessarily the one that's required from your visa application. But which grade must you aim for? For personal reasons. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about Canada later on. Kindly comment. What about the others? The personal target. Okay, let's be practical, guys. Seven is usually enough for you to go to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, all the six English-speaking countries. Now, if you get an eight better, if you get nine better, but kindly remember, whether you get seven or nine, you're going to get exactly the same salary when you go there. 9.0 in writing is not something that everyone gets. And how often is 9.0 in writing given? Just once a year. You might want to ask how many people get 8.0 in writing? 1% of the population. So let's not be too ambitious. Okay, let's not be too excited. Okay, I have a chance in getting 8 in writing. Okay, you have 1% chance in getting 8 in writing. What about a 9 in writing? You have a... Uh, 
once in a year chance of getting 9.0 in writing. So seven is a realistic expectation because if you get seven, that means to say you can apply for all these visas. Now, Raman Deep asked me if, uh, what, what about Canada? May I just ask Raman Deep, which particular visa are you applying for in Canada? Is it student visa or immigrant visa? Because for Canada, it's always dependent on the visa that you're applying for. If it is student visa, it's usually the school that will tell you the required bad score. If it's diploma course, most of the time, it's 5.5 or 6. If it's bachelor's degree, 6 or 6.5. If it's master's degree, 6.5 or 7. But if it's PhD, 7 to 7.5. So what is my suggestion for you? You look for a school that requires a lower bad score. Now, if it's can Canadian immigrant visa application via Express Entry or EE as they call it, the higher the score in IELTS general training, the higher the immigration points, the more chances that you will be invited. So I started with a national average of Filipinos in writing, and that is 6.1. But what about the breakdown of this per criterion? Okay, for task response, it's 6.0. Later on, we will find out if 6.0 is what? Is it high? Is it low as compared to the other? Sound check. I think you can hear me now. I was unmuted just for a bit. So yes, Ramon, you're welcome. Everyone, let's move on to criterion number two. Okay, here's criteria number two, coherence and cohesion. I'll give you time to screenshot or uh, take note before we explain criterion number two, coherence and cohesion. So this criterion assesses the organization, the flow of your essay. So when we say organization, please be advised that IELTS examiners do not necessarily expect that you're going to write in bullet points. You have to write in complete sentences and organized paragraphs. But the question is, how many sentences are ideal in one paragraph? So when I attended the writing workshop of one of my favorite IELTS examiners, Miss Cindy La Rosa, I got this from her. Avoid writing very long paragraphs. Ideally, one paragraph must contain four to five sentences. Cindy La Rosa, by the way, is quite. Now, what about the ideal number of paragraphs in writing task two? Please do not write seven paragraphs. Not that it's wrong. It's just that you may not be able to finish the examination on time. Remember that 20% of the candidates are not likely to finish two tasks in the actual exam. That's why when I attended the writing workshop of one of the examiners I respect the most, Mr. Malcolm Douglas Gamet, I learned from him personally the recommended number of paragraphs in IELTS writing tasks to four or five paragraphs. So let's go back, guys. Four to five sentences per paragraph and four to five paragraphs in the entire essay. That is perfect. Ideal if you are planning to write 250 to 350 words in writing task two. Now, let us define a paragraph. A paragraph is a group of sentences related to each other, which means to say IELTS examiners want you to Stick to one idea per paragraph. The moment you feel the need to present another idea, it is best to write that in a separate paragraph. It is a mortal sin to combine several ideas in one paragraph because that will make your output cluttered. So apart from organization, what else are examiners assessing uh, in your performance for criteria number two? Flow. And when I say flow, class, they are expecting you. The word is expect. They require you to use connective words that are helpful. So let's talk about 
acceptable connective words in writing tasks too. When you start with your first argument in the body of your essay, will you please type in the chat box what are sample connective words that you may possibly use to start with the body of your essay? May I see your comments on the chat box? How do you start the body of your essay? What connective words do you use? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you, Raman. That's actually what I'm expecting you guys to respond. You may write to begin with. You may write, thank you, Maria Veronica, to start with. Okay. First, that's fine. Now, Firstly, secondly, thirdly, not totally wrong. It's just that when I met IELTS examiners, they prefer you just write first, second, third. You, you have to drop the LY. Because writing in the LY form that's uh, passe, that's old English, the English of today prefers that you drop the LYs. Okay? So uh, it's not as if we are expecting you guys to write there for in the body, perhaps you're going to present this later on, but not in the beginning of the body. Now, question. What connective words are you going to use if you're writing a supporting argument, a supporting reason, a supporting detail? Well, at least you're, you're hearing something for the first time. This is worth your time. I repeat, firstly, it's not wrong. It's just that the preference is for you to drop the LYs. Okay. Thank you, Ramon. I like Ramon. He is very participative. Okay. In addition, apart from that, what else can you possibly write as part of or when you write supporting arguments, supporting reasons, supporting details? Moreover, what else, guys? Okay. Furthermore. So here are examples. Okay. Uh, conversely, it's not something that we encourage if you're going to write something that supports. Maybe you can write that if you are presenting the other side of the story, but not when you write a supporting argument, a supporting reason, or a supporting detail. Yes, correct. When you write conversely, it means to say you are contradicting. Okay. Now, what about when you are presenting counter arguments, what are the terms to use this time when presenting counter arguments? This is when you're allowed to write something like, however, correct. On the other hand, in contrast, on the contrary. Please take note, what I said was in contrast, but not on contrast. I did not say in contrary, but I said on the contrary. So IELTS is very particular with accuracy. Before you write, before you think of something grand, make sure that you are correct. Because you cannot forgive yourself if you don't choose words wisely. Now, I like that on the flip side. That's also an alternative for on the other hand. What about when writing examples? What are sample connective words when you write examples? You may write something like, for instance, to illustrate such as, it's just that, will someone... Okay. Will someone please tell me what is strong with like, for example? Anyone? Can you please tell me what is strong with like, for example? Redundant. Very good. Because when you write like, you're already stating an example. Okay? Now, what about the conclusion? Will you please give me examples of connective words that you can write as part of the conclusion? So earlier, one of you recommended therefore... To sum up, to conclude, to recap, okay? Or you can write something like by and large, to drive home the point in a nutshell. At the end of the day, 
there is no singular co co uh, connective word acceptable in the IELTS. That's why we are generating ideas from you so that those attendees with limited knowledge now will get to have an idea. Ah, okay, so this is something that I can use as part of my essay. It's just that we have to be careful with connective words because there are connective words that are more acceptable in writing task one, but not so much in writing task two and vice versa. May I ask you now, what about overall? For which task is this referred? Task one or task two? Overall, is this preferred in task one or task two? Okay, so... You are correct, guys. You are doing your research. It's task one. Usually, you write this as part of your overview to give an examiner an idea. So this is the bird's eye view. This is the general trend overall. Overall, it's not necessarily encouraged in writing task two because you already use this as part of writing task one. Now, what about on the other hand? On the other hand, is a connective which IELTS examiners prefer in task two, but not so much in writing task one. Why? When you are writing, on the other hand, you're presenting the other side of the story. So imagine if you are going to do this in writing task one. For instance, this is what some people write. The land graph shows dot, dot, dot. On the other hand, the bar graph shows, okay, we would rather that you drop on the other hand in writing task What Instead, what do we expect you to write? Something like this. The pie chart shows dot, dot, dot. As for the bar graph, it reveals. So on the other hand, preferred in writing task two, but we would rather you drop it in writing task one. So Notice that speaking is not entirely the same as writing. In speaking, you just have to be yourself. You just have to be conversational. But writing is more technical because there are certain stuff that you have to remember when you come up with your essays. Now, we are done with criteria number two, coherence and cohesion. Earlier, I gave you an idea that for task response, our national average is 6.0. What about coherence and cohesion? Our national average this time is 6.1. Notice it's a little better compared to writing up as compared to the first criterion. But if you're targeting 6.5 or 7, still the national average is nowhere near. Guys, let's move on to the last two criteria. They are lexical resource and grammatical range and accuracy. If you attended last week's Facebook Live session or Zoom meeting, I spoke about lexical resource and uh, grammatical range and accuracy. But I just want to make sure that I'm not redundant here. Okay, how many of you were not able, I'm saying not able to attend last week's speaking lecture with me as the speaker, same time, Wednesday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m.? May I see how many of you did not attend last week? Because if you were here last week, okay, one, two... So I assume that some of you have already attended that last week. Maybe, uh, okay, uh, at least the others now are telling me that they're attending for the first time. That's fine. No problem with that. For the benefit of those who have not attended last week, let's be considerate to them, guys. We have to discuss this one since they were not able. Okay, but saw the recording. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Let's begin with the first line, and it says, correct usage, correct choice of words. Here we go. A lot of people tend to use big words only for the purpose of impressing the examiner. But did you know IELTS is not about impressing? What is IELTS about? IELTS is about expressing. So when you express, you usually pick the most appropriate terms. And more often than not, big words are not welcome in the IELTS. I'd like to share with you 
my personal experience with an examiner, I have worked closely for quite some time. So, Dr. Murray, uh, I became friends with him in 2010 or 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And this is what I've learned from him. If you are not a native speaker and you're applying as an IELTS examiner, what are the requirements? Number one, CELTA, Certification of English Language Teaching. And this is a certification issued by Cambridge. Now, how much is CELTA? CELTA course costs 2,000 US dollars. Multiply that by 50 pesos. That's 100,000 pesos. That's a fortune. So imagine, not everyone can afford a CELTA course. And just because you enroll in this course doesn't mean that you will automatically be conferred the title of an examiner. Apart from CELTA, they require you to have teaching experience, preferably at a university. Number three, if you are not a native speaker, Make sure that you have gotten a nine in writing or a nine in speaking to prove yourself credible. So imagine all these requirements before someone is given the title IELTS examiner. The moment you are hired as an IELTS examiner, you may consider yourself a demigod in English because it's not a title being given to everyone. Now, here's what Murray told me. Well, Irvin, just because someone is an examiner doesn't mean that person understands all the words in the English dictionary. Imagine this situation happening in the actual exam. There is some sort of power struggle. Why? What if you, a candidate, tries to use a big word just to impress the examiner? There might be a tendency for you to annoy the examiner because certain examiners might not understand the big word that you're trying to force in your output. So on the back of the mind of the examiner, the examiner might be thinking, how come I, an IELTS examiner, does not understand this ultra big word that a candidate is using. Do you really think that you can get away with that? Remember, your future is in the hands of your examiner. Do not try to do anything that will annoy your examiner. So instead of using inappropriate big words in your sentence, stick to correct English. Okay? Now, let's go back to vocabulary and lexical resource. It says here, correct usage or correct choice of words. But number two, make sure, apart from accuracy, you have the second ingredient to IELTS success, and that is variety. You cannot use exactly the same words. We need you guys to keep on thinking of something that is uh, uncommon. So now, I'll give you a perfect example. The word good is in English, correct? It's just that everyone can use the word good. I mean, even a grade one pupil, even a kindergarten student can use the word good. So now, will you please comment on the ch chat box, alternative words, because we don't want you to repeat the very common word good. Kindly they give me alternatives apart from good? Favorable, correct? What else? Commendable, excellent. Those are the uh, notable, okay? I appreciate that you're sharing alternative words. That's why we need you to build your vocabulary to avoid the very common expressions at the same time for the sake of variety. Now, brilliant, amazing, correct? What about bad? Will you please tell me what are alternatives for the word bad? Terrific. Okay. I, I think, okay, negative, atrocious, correct, horrible, terrible, okay, awful. Now, I appreciate it that you're giving me alternatives. So say, for instance, I'll just give you an idea in speaking. If the examiner asks you, how are you? Please don't say, I'm good. Good? Are you like an elementary student? So if you're asked in speaking, how are you? 
you can easily tell the examiner, oh, you have no idea, Mr. Examiner. I'm having the time of my life right now. This is the feeling of uh, euphoria, something like that. Or if you're asked, how are you? Please don't say in speaking, I feel bad. Bad? Can't you think of something better than that? You may actually respond in this manner without using big words. I'm actually at the lowest point of my life right now. As recently, I was diagnosed to be, to be clinically depressed. And here I am taking the IELTS because I want to overcome this depression. I want to prove something for myself that I can do this, even if I am currently facing certain challenges. So you see, my response did not contain I'm good or I'm bad, but I thought of something different on how I can possibly express myself using the uncommon expressions without forcing big words as part of your responses. We also, we also expect you to do the same thing in the writing component, okay? Avoid good, avoid bad. Look for something more specific, but not to the point of using the words that an examiner might be required to check the dictionary just to check its meaning. Now, for vocabulary and lexical resource, then someone asked me, so sir, what if I am planning to get uh, a targeting uh, if I'm planning to get or target nine for lexical resource, am I required to use idioms? Okay, let's go back to the word required. Are you required? No. If you use one idiom correctly in your essay, as long as it's in the right context, go ahead. But please don't try to force idioms in every sentence or in every paragraph because it's just not natural. Now, Someone asked me, sir, what is your opinion if you're going to write quotes or sayings? Here we go. When I attended the writing workshop of IELTS examiner, Iris Astillero, I learned from her, it's fine to use quotes and sayings for as long as you don't copy the words of other people. So please do not write, practice makes perfect, time is gold, health is wealth. The family is the basic unit of society. Preven uh, prevention is better than cure. Why not? Because those are words of other people. So instead of writing something like, no man is an island, I would rather that you write something like this. Social interaction or social interaction is the great human spirit. And what does this mean? To socialize with others, that's the essence of man, right? We cannot live in isolation. No man is an island. A different way of expressing this social interaction is the great human spirit. Do you get what I'm saying, guys? Of course, I cannot see you. I cannot hear you. But I can read your comments. Okay, from IFNG, can we include the name of the person you got it from? It's fine, as long as avoid the super common ones. Life is short, time is gold, health is wealth. Not that one, okay? If you want to quote, say for instance, according to Warren Buffett, according to Harry Truman, that's fine. At least you're quoting a specific person, but try not to use the ones that are super common already. Okay, now here comes vocabulary and le uh, lexical resource. What is our national average for this criterion? It's 6.9. So imagine an average person can get a 6.9 for vocabulary even without the use of un unnecessarily big words. So... I guarantee an average person can get a high grade here provided that the words are correct are not and are not exactly the same. So let's have a recap. Criteria number one, our national average is 6.0. The second one is 6.1. The third one, lexical resource, 6.9. 6.9. Now let us move on to the fourth, the last of the four criteria. Okay. Let me just scroll down. There you go. Grammatical range and accuracy. We're going to divide this into two parts. Accuracy versus 
range. And let's talk about accuracy. The common areas of difficulty of most people. Number one, subject verb agreement. Usually, people commit subject verb errors because they don't know how to identify the subject in the sentence. And I'll give you this as the perfect example. The number of children rises. Is this right or wrong? You only have two options, right or wrong. The number of children rises, right or wrong? Okay, wrong, 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 wrong. The number of children rises. So far, no one got it right. That is correct. Huh? How come that is correct, sir? It's simple. Most people think of the word children as plural. You know what? You are right. The word children is really plural. It's just that. In this phrase, the number of children rises. Children is not the subject. The subject here is the number. Thank you, Miss Eds. The number is singular. So the number rises. The problem in English, the word before the verb is not always the subject. Sometimes the subject is over there in the beginning of the sentence. Learn how to identify the subject because the subject will tell you what the correct verb must be. What about pronoun use? Guys, will you please tell me if this is right or wrong? Okay. Everyone must consider their parents' wishes. Everyone must consider their parents' wishes. Is this right or wrong? Please type on the chat box. Right. Everyone must consider their parents' wishes. Correct. Right. Thank you, Jcast. It's wrong. Why? What about the word everyone? Is this singular or plural? Everyone, singular or plural? This is singular. What about the word there? T-H-E-I-R, the pronoun T-H-E-I-R. Is that singular or plural? There, T-H-E-I-R is actually plural. So you see, they're not consistent. So instead of writing, everyone must consider their parents' wishes, I would rather you must write something like this. Everyone must consider his or her parents' wish. Or you can rephrase it into something like, all must consider their parents' wishes. There is not consistent with everyone. Okay. What about the next slide? Consistency of verb tenses. No time traveling in the IELTS. If you start your idea in the present tense, it has to be Present tense all throughout that paragraph. When you start the paragraph in the past tense, it has to be past tense all throughout that paragraph. Please do not commit that mortal sin of combining past and present in exactly the same paragraph. No time traveling in the IELTS. What about the prepositions? Instead of learning words which are too complicated and are not used in uh, academic context, I would rather that you learn how to use in, at, on, by, with, to, for, because remember, they, or if you're able to correctly use them, they will encourage the examiner for you to be given a high grade for grammatical range and accuracy. But what about the word range? IELTS examiners want you to avoid short, choppy sentences. Class. No matter how perfect your sentences are, you do not expect a seven in grammar if this is how you're right. Listen, I am happy. My mother is happy. My father is happy. I love my happy family. Wow, I'm happy for you. It can't get any happier than that. What did you notice? All of those sentences are correct. They're perfect. It's just that, imagine, I am happy. My mother is happy. My father is happy. They're too short. Even an elementary pupil 
can come up with four, four words in one sentence. Class, remember, range. You need to display just a little complexity in your sentence structure while you prove to your examiner that even if my sentence is longer than the basic sentence, my grammar remains accurate from beginning to end. So now, what is the national average for grammatical range and accuracy? It's 6.2. You might be wondering, sir, let's do the mathematics. 6.0 plus 6.1 plus 6.9 plus 6.2. How come the average is not 6.3? For, don't, re, don't forget what I've shared with you is the average per criterion in task two. Writing task one is lower. FYI, the reason why a lot of candidates do not get a grade of seven in writing it's not because of writing task two it's actually because of writing task one writing task one is the one pulling us down come to think of it when you were in school how many times did you come up with an essay quite a lot of the uh, quite a lot of times right but when you were in school how many times did you deal with a line graph bar graph pie chart table I'm sure when you're in the hospital when you're a nurse working in the ER or the OR you're not going to, or your doctor, when asking for the forcep, for instance, your doctor says, okay, nurse, forcep, please. Definitely, you're not going to say this to your doctor when handing over the forcep. Hey, doctor, the line graph shows the unemployment rate in UK in 1900. Overall, there was an increase. So imagine writing task one or statistical writing is usually what? out of this world for most of us. So here I am telling you now, you want to maximize your chances in getting a seven in writing, focus on writing task one because this is the one pulling the candidates down. What did you notice? What did you notice? It's my approach when teaching. I don't get my information out of thin air. When I teach, I usually anchor it on statistics because if you were here last week, I am not an English major. I finished a degree in BA Communication Research, and that is a statistical, uh, statistical writing course. That's why more than anything else, statistics means the whole world to me. Now, we're done with the four criteria. Let us take a look at the different types of questions. Okay, we're down to the second half of our lecture. We're done with the four criteria. Now, what about the types of questions? If you want to uh, take a photo, if you want to screenshot, go ahead, no problem. For as long as we maximize your potential in getting the required batch score. So the first one, agree or disagree. Sometimes the exact question is, to what extent do you agree or disagree? The second type of question, discuss both views. The third one, open-ended. Now, how do you know that it's open-ended? Usually, if you don't see agree or disagree, if you don't see discuss both views, that's what we call an open-ended type. So for open-ended, sometimes you get to see what are the reasons, what are the causes, what are the effects, what are the solutions, what are your recommendations. Those are the typical questions for open-ended. Now, the fourth one, do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? In the regular lecture, we tackle all of them. But hello, this is a free class where everyone is welcome to attend and we have a limit of two hours per week. So last week, two hours for speaking now, two hours for writing tasks to hopefully will be given the go signal to conduct writing task one for two weeks next week, Wednesday, and then reading the following week and then listening the following week. Meanwhile, I'll just focus on the first one, agree or disagree. To give you an idea how you're supposed to deal with this on the actual exam. Now let's take a look at the parts of an essay for agree or disagree. In the introduction, the IELTS examiners expect that you're going to present the topic using your own words. 
without copying the exact words found in the task description. At the same time, you are required to include your stance. So what is the stance? This is the one that says whether you agree or disagree with something. It's just that. IELTS examiners are sick and tired of encountering the word agree every single day while they are checking an essay. So now, uh, as for your participation once again, will you please tell me what are alternative words that you guys can use in a writing task too for you to say you agree? Other words apart from agree, okay? Kindly comment. Participation is a must. This is not a monologue. It's a two-way stream. Give me an alternative term for agree. I don't expect everyone to use exactly the same word agree in the actual exam. Come on. Apart from agree, you don't have alternative words. Okay. I coincide. Thank you, Rowena. What about the others? I concur. Thank you, Miss Eds. I am convinced that. Mm -hmm. What else? I affirm. I support the idea of. I am in favor of. So you see, they don't have to. Okay, I hold the same view. You see, they don't have to be complicated for as long as you don't settle for the term agree that more than half of the candidates use in the actual exam. Okay, incongruence. Lovely. What about the alternative? When you disagree with something, give me examples of connective words when you disagree with something. Okay, alternate for I disagree. I'm sure, okay. I defer, I stand to oppose. What else? I reject the notion. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. I vary. I I beg to defer. Okay. I object. I oppose. So the others clearly have an idea how to deal with writing. But you see, be careful when you play with words because sometimes they are not in the correct context. Okay. So in the body, what are you expected to write? Two to three paragraphs. Because in the introduction, you're expected to write just one paragraph. Around, I ideally, four to five sentences. But if that might be too long, okay, four will do. Fine with that. Now, what about the body? So this is when you're expected to come up with two to three paragraphs. But per paragraph, around four to five sentences. Guys, this typical number of sentences per paragraph, typical number of paragraphs per essay, they are not strict requirements. They are just there as a guide to help you come up with a structure. But it's not as if you will automatically fail if you only write three or two sentences in one paragraph. You will not automatically fail if you write seven sentences in one paragraph. We're talking about the preferred, but these are not laws. Okay? Now, in the body... I suggest that you remember the acronym A-R-E. How do we spell A-R-E? Uh, rather, how do we spell the linking verb R? A-R-E, right? A stands for arguments, R, reasons, and then E, examples, or experience. Later, when we go to the model essay, we're going to look at how Brian wrote his arguments, his reasons, and his examples. In the conclusion, IELTS examiners don't want you to present anything new. No new examples, no new experience. The purpose of the conclusion is to restate your stand and to summarize the key points. So to speak, what you're seeing on this slide, this is like your skeleton. Now, it will remain a skeleton if you don't add me. Now let's move on to the substance, the content part. I'll just skip this portion here. We cannot talk about all of them in two hours. So this is a sampler. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I am 
honored to present to you the output of Brian Martin Shawson, who, when he took the IELTS, got nine in writing, nine in speaking, nine overall band score, nine in listening, and nine in reading. Brian first worked with us, 9.09er, in 2009. So he's one of our lecturer 12 years now, and in fact, he is the head of our online review program. Brian, by the way, took English exams thrice. So IELTS Academic, IELTS General Training, and PTE or Pearson Test of English. So in his three attempts, what grades did he get in writing? Perfect 90 over 90 in PTE writing, a 9.0 in IELTS writing, and an 8.5 in IELTS writing, which means to say in three attempts, he got the perfect score in two. And on his uh, third attempt, the second highest score. Now, if you're going to say, oh, it's just a fluke. It's just a coincidence that he got the perfect grade in his writing subtest. But it's not fluke anymore. When he took it thrice and he got the perfect grade in two out of three attempts and the second highest grade in the third attempt. Now, I'll prove to you that you don't have to be a poet. You don't need to use Shakespeare's English just to get a high bad score. So perhaps after reading this output, you'll never look at 9.0 in writing in the same way again. Because in the first place, it is not intimidating. Ladies and gentlemen, the task description is the best way to solve the world's environmental problem is to increase the cost of fuel. To what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement? Let's begin with Brian's first sentence. As globalization continues and the world heads into the future, the Earth's natural processes Wait a minute. I just have to move this one so I can see. Okay. There you go. The Earth's natural processes are altered, leading to major environmental challenges. So what did you notice in Brian's first sentence? He started with the general topic. And what is the general topic here? In environment. He did not mention fuel yet because that's the specific topic which he is expected to present in the next sentence. Now, what about the second sentence if I may read it for you? With the assumption that fuel consumption greatly affects. Okay, let me just stop right there. Look at the word greatly. Class, will you please tell me what is greatly? Kindly comment on the chat box. What is greatly? It belongs to which part of speech? Everyone, what is greatly? It belongs to which part of speech? Greatly is an adverb. Okay. So, IELTS examiners need you to use verbs nouns, pronouns, adjectives, adverbs. But if you're able to use descriptive words correctly in IELTS, they will help you in getting a higher grade for vocabulary and lexical resource. So let's go back to that sentence. Brian could have easily written, with the assumption that fuel consumption affects ecological balance. No, he decided to add a word such as greatly for him to get a higher grade in his English component. Now, let's move on. Certain conservation groups propose to make petrol more expensive to solve the world's environmental problems. So notice, first sentence, Brian started with the general topic. And then second sentence, he, present, he went on to, or he moved to, the specific topic. So first sentence, environment in general. Second sentence, fuel consumption. Now let us move on to his stand. While this is a valid suggestion, so the word valid here is an adjective describing the word suggestion, 
Let's continue. It is my belief that this approach cannot address all of the environmental concerns of the world. Let us go back to the question, agree or disagree. But Brian here, for his introduction, did not use the exact word, I agree or I disagree. But based on the last sentence of his introduction, will you please tell me now, what is the stand of Brian in his intro? Is it agree or disagree? Type on the chat box. Okay, disagree. Correct. Why? Which part gives us an idea that he does not agree with the statement? He claimed that this approach might be valid, but it does not address all of the environmental concerns of the world, which is actually the point of this question. The question does not tell us that increasing the cost of fuel is an effective way. No, that is not the point of the question. The point of the question is increasing the cost of fuel is the best way. So Brian here said, to a certain extent, it might be valid, it might be acceptable, but it is not the best because it cannot address all of the problems. Now, let's pay attention to the word environment. So some people are saying, sir, wait a minute, I think this is being repetitive because the word environment appeared in every sentence. Now, you have to forgive Brian, because the word environment is the main topic. You have no choice but to keep on repeating it. But what is it that he did not repeat? The word associated with environment. Now look at the next word after environment in every sentence. First sentence, environmental challenges. Second sentence, environmental problems. Third sentence, is, uh, third sentence, environmental concerns. So challenges, problems, concerns, these are the words that Brian did not repeat. So if we are going to analyze his introduction, he divided it into three parts. General topic, followed by specific topic, and then his stand without using the exact word agree or disagree. And look at his sentences. His sentences are not short and choppy. They are longer than the typical sentence. And he is using descriptive words like valid or greatly. Now, let us move on to the body. What are we expecting to find in the body? Arguments that support the stand. Now, let's take a look. It is probably true. So probably here is another descriptive word right? That's an adverb. It is probably true to say that many motorists would be discouraged to use cars excessively. There you go, another uh, descriptive term, another modifier. When the price of oil is increased, this move may potentially reduce the emission of carbon dioxide and harmful pollutants into the air. Look at how he shifted. He started with probably, excessively, potentially. But this time around, he did not settle for the adverb form. He used an adjective this time, harmful pollutants into the air. Moving on, which would result in. Everyone pay attention to result in. When I check essays, majority of the candidates write result to. But FYI, result to is wrong. The partner of result must be in and not to. Moving forward, kindly remember, yes to result in, no to result to. Let's continue. Result in the reduction of global warming and air pollution. Class, what are, will you please tell me, what's global warming? What's air pollution? They are examples of what? What do we call global warming and air pollution? They are examples of? Answer. Okay. They are examples of environmental concerns, environmental challenges, environmental problems. And as I've mentioned earlier, examples are a must in your output. Which means to say, if you are not able to write examples, then you don't 
you don't expect a higher grade. Okay, so for task response, for you to get at least seven here, don't forget to include examples as part of your essay. Let's continue. However, doing so clearly does not help with the issues that do not emanate or come from the use of you, such as. So now, he's presenting other envir environmental problems that cannot be addressed by increasing the cost of fuel. And what are these? Water pollution, improper waste management, and severe deforestation. Imagine Brian could have easily written water pollution, waste management, deforestation. But no, he added descriptive words to get a higher grade for lexical resource, like what? Improper waste management, severe deforestation. And I loved how this paragraph was written first as compared to the other paragraphs. Why? If you go back to his stand in his introduction, he said, to a certain extent, this is a valid suggestion. And you know what? It is really valid. Why? Because imagine... If oil becomes too expensive, then the others would be discouraged initially from using cars excessively. That's the point of the first sentence, right? It's just that even if you double the cost of fuel, there are still people who will engage in unscrupulous activities like what? Illegal logging. They, there are those who will just keep on throwing waste, which means to say they don't segregate, they don't recycle. So even if you increase the cost of fuel, it might address air pollution, it might address global warming, but it will not address all of the environmental concerns of the world. That's why this paragraph is best, because it explains why it is not the number one most effective way of dealing with the problem. So the first paragraph in the body must be the strongest. Why? How would you expect the examiner to read the remainder of the output if the first paragraph in the body is weak? That's why before you come up with your essay, plan ahead of time. Make an outline. Which argument am I supposed to present first, next, and so on? Don't write right away. It's as if you're uh, putting up a building. When you start, you don't build right away. You make some strategic planning. You make some pencil pushing first. And this is exactly what you're required to do in the actual exam. Even before you write, what do you do? You brainstorm, you come up with an outline because it's much easier for you to write, okay, flawlessly. If you already know what you're supposed to present first, what you're supposed to present next, and how you're going to end your output. Now, let's move on to paragraph number two. Another point to consider is the social structure and culture of people in certain countries. Look at how smart Brian is. In his introduction, he mentioned something about globalization. He mentioned something about ecological balance. This time, he mentioned social structure and culture. When I met IELTS examiner Ian Wall, I asked him, so Ian, what's the difference between seven and nine? And he said that there is a thin line that separates a mediocre from the perfect score. And usually, it is substance. It's the level of intelligence that distinguishes an average output from a well-written output. So show you are well-informed. If you can present an interesting information that you got from research or something that you've learned or encountered from a journal, a publication, or say, for instance, Reader's Digest or Time Magazine or Newsweek, go ahead. If it will help establish the strength of your argument, remember, blessed are those who are smart for they will get a higher grade in writing in general. Don't get me wrong. Correct English is everything. But correct English is not enough for you to get a 9. It's display of content that will invite the examiner to give you a 9 in writing. So let's continue. What about the second argument of Brian? Here we go. The social structure and culture of 
people in certain countries. He presented an example in the next sentence, in developing nations, for instance. Remember, there's the connective right there when he uh, wrote an example. The great majority of the individuals who own cars belong to the rich and privileged, although an increase in the cost of petrol would initially hurt meaning to say only in the beginning, it would not keep them from using cars for as long as they can easily afford the price of fuel, no matter how expensive. Now, let us consider two questions. Number one, how much is the cost of fuel right now? I don't drive, that's why I don't know. Will you please give me an idea? For one liter of, say, for instance, gasoline or diesel, how much does it cost now? Just in case you know, give me a ballpark figure. 39, according to CAF. Okay, guys, obviously, we're using pesos, okay, as our currency. Question, if in case, okay, so in India, it's 95. The question is, what if in Philippine pesos from 39 to 44, all of a sudden, Shell, Petron, Caltex, uh, Flying V, Phoenix, all, all of them, what if they are going to charge 100 pesos per liter? Do you think the rich can still afford 100 pesos per liter? Yes or no? If we're going to double the price of oil, can the rich people still afford to purchase it? Cat, a calf, thank you so much. Yes. In the first place, 100 pesos per liter is nothing for them. Why? How much is a car? Let's talk about an affordable sedan. Say, for instance, Vios. Again, I don't drive and car is not really something that I fancy. So I don't know how much it costs. But please give me an idea. How much does a Toyota Vios cost? Okay, so 540,000. Others are staying ranging from 800,000 to 1 million. And let's admit it, if you belong to class D or class E, you cannot afford a car. Chances are, if you belong to class C, you might be able to buy a car, but not really uh, spot cash. M most likely, it's uh, on a salary deduction basis or you just have to pay a monthly amortization. But for class A, for class B, 540000 800000 700000 that's nothing for them. They can even afford to buy a car at at least 540,000 pesos. How much more liter at just 100 pesos per liter? That is the point of Brian in this paragraph. That, okay, you have to understand the social structure and culture. Yes, not everyone can own a car. But for those who own cars, they are the ones who are rich and privileged. It will not hurt them at all. If we increase the cost of fuel, still, by increasing the cost of fuel, there will still be air pollution, there will still be global warming. Well, something that's unexpected, okay? What's the twist? The air now, the world over, is a lot healthier than before. Thanks to COVID-19, oh, there you go. It's just the virus that we're waiting for to clean the air. Why? With fewer flights, with limited transportation. Now the air is healthier. That, that's something which was totally unexpected. Well, I understand a lot of people suffered from COVID-19, but if we look at the positive side, the environment actually benefited from this one. Not necessarily increasing the cost of fuel, you see? Let's now move on to the third paragraph in the body. Okay, I also believe that this measure is at best temporary because it focuses more on governmental policy rather than individual responsibility. 
Ryan is not mentioning theories. He is not mentioning, according to Republic Act, blah, 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 or according to the Kyoto Protocols, something like that. No, he's very simple when he comes up with his essays. And what did you notice? He initially started with, well, there's globalization now. He mentioned something about ecological balance, then social structure of uh, and culture of countries. Now, he moved on to governmental policy and then individual responsibility. He said that if we want to address the problem of the environment in general, what is the long-lasting solution? Let's take a look at how he continued with this paragraph. Since most of the world's environmental problems result from Earlier, I said it has to be result in. But what's the difference between result in and result from? When you write result in, that means what's the consequence? What's the effect? But when you write result from, it means to say the cause. Okay? Result from, correct. Result in, correct. But result to, wrong. Moving on. From the inconsiderate actions of man. So he is not yet finished with his descriptive words. So now there is inconsiderate. Inconsiderate actions of man. None of these would be permanently resolved unless people would learn how to live in a way that is greener and friendlier to the environment. What is he saying? Well, increasing the cost of fuel is not the best solution. Instead, it might be better to think of a long-lasting solution, and that is to change the mindset of people. Now, if I may ask you, what is the function of uh, Congress and Senate? I am trying to arrive at a point here. Will you please tell me? What's the main function of the government? What's the main function of the Senate and the Congress, rather? That's what I meant. Anyone? Main function of Senate and Congress? They make laws, correct? Yes, if we keep on making laws, how sure are we that we can really implement it? Because sometimes people just follow the law, not because it comes from their heart. It's not written in the palm of their hands. It's not as if the stars aligned and all of a sudden they conform to the rule. They've become obedient. No, it's nothing like that. They only follow the law simply because they don't want to be sent to jail. But it's not as if it's voluntary. I'll give you a perfect example. Say, for instance, traffic rules and regulations. So Metro Manila has plenty of traffic lights and traffic rules, but usually they are followed during daytime. Trying to go out at, say for instance, 12 midnight, some of the drivers no longer follow the rules. Why? Because they know the traffic enforcer, enforcers are not monitoring that they can't be caught anymore. So sometimes they swerve, they overspeed, then they turn left when it's supposed to be no left turn and so on. Because they know they can get away with it. The point of Brian here is, you want to address the problem of the environment, then don't come up with new laws. What do you do? You change the mindset of people. Because if you're able to do something like that, you ask people to live in such a way that is friendlier, greener to the environment, then you don't have to make laws anymore because people do it out of their own will, voluntary, so to speak. Now, let us move on to Brian's conclusion. He did not come up with something like, in conclusion or in summary or therefore because yeah that, that's quite common so he just wrote something like to my mind increasing the cost of fuel is but a short-term relief to the world's environmental problems go back to the intro go back to the body there was no part that brian wrote something like short term what is it 
that he wrote in, the, in his conclusion. He expressed the key points using not exactly the same words that appeared in the intro and in the body. So if we increase the cost of fuel, it's just a, it's just a short term relief. You really want to solve the problem. The best way is not to increase the cost of fuel, but raising the individual concern for the environment. That would be a better and more lasting solution. I've just presented Sir Brian Martin Shawson's 9.0 in writing. Now, why did I tell you earlier that you'll never look at 9.0 in writing in the same way again? Maybe, just maybe, before reading this output, you might be thinking of 9.0 as the unreachable star, something that's just a pretty constellation in the sky that you're not meant to hold, something impossible. But now, we are coming up with an output. That number one goes direct to the point, answers the question, bullseye. He hits the target with examples that are not even local. Brian ever wrote in the Philippines. He did not write, in my experience, but he presented global problems, developing nations. Number two, coherence and cohesion. He usually sticks to an idea per paragraph. He uses connective words like to my mind, uh, for instance, however. And then if you count the, the number of paragraphs, there's just five. For the body, it, most of his paragraphs had four sentences, intro and conclusion, like two, three sentences. And then for the lexical resource, he did not use ultra big words that sound awkward. The biggest word I think I've encountered here is emanate, but that's not an entirely big word. I mean, there are people who understand emanate, but what's most important, he used it correctly. And then for grammatical range and accuracy, this is flawless from beginning to end, clean as a whistle. So I hope that you're going to scrutinize this output even more as Sir Brian has more model essays uh, as part of the 9.09er online review dashboard. Why? When you get an idea from people who have taken the examination and have gotten the perfect band score, it will help you in coming up with your own output without clouding your judgment. Okay? You can use them as basis for your own approach. Now, let's have a recap of what we have discussed tonight so far. We started with the four criteria, and then we talked about the outline for agree or disagree, and we're looking right now at a model essay that got the perfect nine in IELTS writing. So the time now on my phone is 10.36. Perhaps we can accommodate uh, questions in the next few minutes. We're now opening uh, the floor for questions, clarifications in writing task two. Please, no questions related to writing task one, listening and reading as we don't want to preempt our discussions in the next few Wednesdays. I'm looking at my chat box now and it seems to me that there is no question. Interesting. Or maybe I'm not seeing the questions on uh, coming from the Facebook Live audience because the questions that I have with me here are just the questions from Zoom. Okay, here's a question from Abigail. If writing Tasu, can we use some phrasal verbs? Definitely, for as long as they're in the correct context. So how do you get seven? Correct English. Okay. Phrasal verbs are definitely part of language. But how do you get nine? Correct English plus remarkable content. Content that will move mountains. Content that will make people cry. Okay, as of now, no FB question. Here's, uh, do punctuations matter? Of course. This is scholastic setup, right? Formal, not colloquial, which means to say 
I'm not expecting anyone to use terms like ain't, gonna, whatcha, no, I'm saying, whatcha, call it. They are not accepted in IELTS because they are not in the formal context. And punctuations, definitely, they are part and parcel of formality. So punctuations matter. Okay, here's another question. What if I don't have an idea? Well, you don't have an idea if you don't know what usually comes out in the examination. So get your pen and paper and get your gadget. Here are the most common topics in writing because I need you to start reading articles related to these. The top three most common topics that come out every month. Number one, people and society. Number two, technology. Number three, environment. Okay, number four and number five come out, but not as often as the first three. So number four, anything that deals with the government and politics. And number five, environment. It's impossible that you don't know anything except if you have not read about these five. But if you start to read, you feed your mind. Remember, there is nothing to write if there is nothing in here. So what are we doing in preparation for the exam? We feed our mind. It's impossible not to come up with 250 words if you read up on the five topics mentioned. Okay, let me just go back to the questions one moment. Okay, what if I exceeded the maximum 350 words? Will that affect the score? Okay, clarification, Miss Marion, you are not going to fail if you write more than 350 words. 350 there is just the suggested maximum, but not the required maximum. Suggested in the sense that you have to finish the two outputs in one hour because 20% of candidates cannot finish two outputs in one hour, maybe because they write unnecessarily long essays. So yes, you may write more than 350 words for as long as you can finish the essays on time. So another question from Ramon. Is it okay with two paragraphs? One for cost and second one for effects. No problem with that for as long as you go back to the question and make sure that all the important keywords in the question or task description are tackled in your essay. And then... Here's another question. Most effective way to boost our score in writing task two. Okay, Hazel, look at the four criteria in our national average in each. Granting you are an average person, Hazel, okay? Task response, our national average is 6.0. Coherence and cohesion, our national average is 6.1. Lexical resource, our national average is 6.9. Grammatical range and accuracy, our national average is 6.2. Now, Hazel, instead of me answering the question, let me ask you, what do you think will boost your score in writing task two? In which particular criterion should you focus on? I'll wait for the answer from Hazel. Sometimes I don't want to answer all the questions without allowing you to think about your own question. Sometimes it's better that you answer your own question and I will verify or I will double check if your, if your response sounds logical or not. Okay, while waiting for Hazel to respond, Roel asks, please repeat the five common topics. What are those? People in society, technology, environment. The top three come out every month. How do I know? Well, I have been teaching IELTS since 2006, May. 15 years of my life I have devoted to this examination. Maybe, just maybe, I can even teach in my dreams if it has become a part of my daily routine. Okay, number four and number five number four, politics slash government. Number five, environment. Okay, and then from Rain, how can I have some copies of the essays? Well, there's just one essay that's uh, found here, but the other essays are available on the 9.09er .09 mobile app. So all you have to do is to look for 
9.09 or IELTS OET PTE. That is, it's available on uh, Apple, iOS, and Android. Okay, you can look for us on App Store and Google Play. Download for free. By the way, we have two uh, categories of content. The free content open for all and the second one, paid content. We will activate your paid content once you sign up with our program. Okay? So, where was I? Okay. So, here's the uh, 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 from Gretzel so May. Is it 250 or 350 words for writing tasks? The minimum is 250. That's a strict minimum. What about 350? That is not the strict maximum, but the preferred maximum. I hope you get the difference between required and preferred. Okay. Okay. For Hazel, in fact, it's the other way around. Why? Imagine an average Filipino can already get a 6.9 here. It's already close to 7, right? How do we maximize your chances in getting a higher band score in the writing subtest? We have to work out on our weakness as a nation, and that is task response. Because for most examiners, our answers are what? Superficial. You want to get a higher grade in writing? Focus on content. Okay? So you see, that's why I asked you guys first for me to check how well you think about it. An average person can already get 6.9. You, you don't expect that we're going to get an 8 for lexical resource, right? So we focus on our content. Okay, there's a question here from Abigail. How can we know, sir, if the lexical resource we want to use is highfalutin or academic? Because when I tried to have evaluation in essay, they said I have to be careful in using some words. Okay, Abigail, Give me a sample of a word and I'll tell you if it's highfalutin or not. Once again, I, will, I, I don't answer questions right away. I want you to think about it first because in the actual examination, there is no Sir Irvin beside you. You can ask, Sir Irvin, can I do this? Can I do that? I want to train you guys to think on your own. Okay? Because at the end of the day, you are by yourself in the actual examination room. So, Abigail, give me an example of a word and I'll tell you if it's highfalutin enough or not. Sharon, can we use question mark in conclusion? What for? If you're trying to ask a question, instead of asking the question, why don't you state it in declarative form? Thank you. Assimilate. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. Abigail said assimilate. Question, guys. Do you understand assimilate? Guys, do you understand the word assimilate? Okay, INFG said no. What about the others? Do you understand the word assimilate? Okay, to belong. No, no, yes, not familiar. Okay, so Abigail, I hope that answered your question. If more people don't understand it, don't use it. Okay, now... For the entire output of Brian, the biggest word I've encountered earlier is just emanate. Some may understand that, the others might not. But if it's just one out of the more than 300 words for this output, Brian can actually be forgiven. Okay? Now, maybe... Okay, 1047. Uh, I can perhaps accommodate one or two questions. I'll just ask the moderators, the admin of IFNG, okay? IFNG, wait, will I still be given a free slot for next week? Because if yes, I'm planning to conduct writing task one lecture next week. Yes, yes sir. sir. Uh, well, what about you guys, do you think? Yes. <laughs> Which, uh, guys, am I wasting your time or... Okay, let, let's put an end to this madness. We, we don't like Niner. We're not learning anything from them. We won't give them time slots anymore. Their vote, Marian said, their vote means a lot, guys. Speak up if you want to 
keep uh, Sir Irvin to have his lecture for the succeeding week. So, yes, so we have two yeses, three yeses, Bro. the fourth yes. No. Welcome to X Factor, Char. <laughs> okay. Oh. From our Facebook Live. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so for next week, it's writing task one. Yes. Okay. So same Wednesday time, is plotted 9 for you. to 11 p.m. Yes, sir, Irvin. So Wednesday is plotted for now, you. You might, coming you, you might want to ask, so what happens after five weeks? I mean, we've had enough of you. Um, maybe you want <laughs> Brian to be your lecturer for the next five Wednesdays. So that's 10 Wednesdays already. Who knows? The next five Wednesdays after Brian, it could be Philip. So who's Philip? Philip got nine in speaking, nine overall band score, nine in listening, nine in reading, and an eight in writing. So we don't just get random people to teach at niner. Okay. Impressive. Because okay, so uh, Red, so I'm sorry, sorry, go on. I wasn't able to hear it. So. Yeah, I was just waiting for questions, but if there are no more questions, allow <laughs> me to take this golden opportunity to thank you guys for your time. Sure, and sure. what did you notice in, in the last two hours or so? I, I'm not the typical person who keeps on promoting. I teach. So if you feel that we are the right people to help you in getting the required band score, you know who we are. But if you think that, okay, the Facebook Live session or the Zoom session is enough, I don't need to enroll, well, at least I'm happy that we were able to share the knowledge that we have we have at 9.09er. And we're, we're not really requiring everyone to be a part of our paid classes. We're just here to extend a helping hand if you think that you need more. But if the two-hour sampler for writing is enough, then I don't want to wish you the best of luck because, well, let's just respect religious beliefs. I am a Catholic. I am a Christian, so to speak. So instead of me saying good luck, I'd rather say God bless. Hey. Very well said, Sir Irvin. So, your uh, every Wednesday is now plotted for you guys and Niners. So, uh, every session is in fruitful. So, Mr. M, anything to add? Uh, thank you, Sir Irvin, for your time and your dedication to help us. You're every welcome. I hope, you... for nice I hope yes, you can also awesome. invite your friends next week. It's free anyway. If you want to be part of the Zoom class, you can just message the admins of IFNG. Thank you, by the way, Sir Jeff, Miss Gladys, Sir Mar Marben for inviting us. And I hope that we were not able to disappoint you by giving us this free slot. Yeah, so we are looking forward every Wednesday. Right? And so, Sir Irvin, looking forward for your lectures, most especially in writing, because most of us are having this hard time. Aside from speaking, so writing is one of the dreaded uh, part of the examination. So indeed, this uh, lecture is fruitful for everyone. Okay, so Sir Marvin, anything to add? And anything else to add before we end the meeting? Okay, from our FB Live, they are saying thank you, Sir Irving, for your time. Yeah. And also You're from IFNG, thank you, sir. Oh, by the way, as of the moment, we have 42 participants on Zoom and then, oh, oh 100 on Facebook. So earlier we have at least 160, we're averaging 160. at least 160 on Facebook Live. So any questions, guys, before we part ways <laughs> tonight? <laughs> Any questions? Well, they, they can message me directly if they're quite oh. shy to ask the question now. You can reach me on Facebook and I'm very responsive. I might not be able to respond immediately at the time when you message me because I also teach like almost every day. But during my free time, I usually open my messenger. Okay, so indeed guys, Sir Irvin is indeed responsive. So you can message him yes. if you have any questions. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's all. So let's call it a night, guys. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Sir Irvin. So see you again next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night from the Philippines.